Good evening everyone. Glad you guys are here. We're going to be starting an important chapter this evening, uh, Revelation chapter 13. Uh, we're going to spend uh, quite a few lessons on this chapter. We're going to finish the whole chapter this evening, but I'm going to give you subsequent lessons. I'll go back and summarize some of the information because there is a lot of information in Revelation chapter 13. Let's read the first two verses. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Every kingdom that's not for God is against God. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leper. This is the, Don is not describing this beast that he's seen coming out of the sea. And he says, the beast which I saw was like unto a leper, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him power, and his seat and great authority. Again, Revelation chapter 13 is another parenthetical chapter. God gives us additional information. Who remembers when, at what point, did God suspend the narrative of the tribulation? Who remembers? Okay, what happened? Close. The seventh trumpet. That's right. <laughs> the seventh trumpet was sounded, but we are not told what happened. So God break pauses the narrative. At the end of chapter 11, the angel blows the seventh trumpet. And so now from chapter 12, 13, and 14, God's giving us additional information about the tribulation. And who remembers we said what time, uh, what chapter does the narrative begin again? 15. No. 15. Chapter 15. The narrative That's begins right. again. I didn't hear him. I thought you said 13. I'm sorry. If you said 15, okay. You could speak a little louder so I can hear you over here. So, the question was, at what chapter does the narrative begin again? It begins again in chapter 15. So now, 13, 14, 12, 13, 14 are additional information that God gives us. So, in this chapter, we are told about two beasts. One beast comes out of the sea. We just read about this beast in verse 1. And the other beast comes up out of the earth. We're going to read about this beast in verse 11. Now, in the Bible, a beast is primarily a king and then a kingdom. So, the beast is used in scriptures interchangeably to represent a king and a kingdom. So, now we will see that the beast in verse 1 is both a king and a kingdom. It's interesting that the dragon is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13. And the word dragon is found 13 times. In the book of Revelation. And 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. And number 13 we are told about the last kingdom. That will rule over the nations of the earth. Which is a kingdom that we just read in verse 1. Uh, it's not surprising that uh, the, the number 13. If you study it throughout the scriptures. We're not going to spend a lot of time this evening. We studied it uh, to some extent in our lesson in Genesis. You can turn back and study uh, our lesson in Genesis on that. Uh, I'll give you some more typology that the uh, number 13 is the number of rebellion. In the 13th, uh, Nimrod is a type of the Antichrist. We studied Nimrod. Who remembers who Nimrod was? Nimrod. Daniel. He was the one who, I think he uh, built the Tower of Babel. Yeah, he was the one that built the Tower of Babel. Very good, but what else did he do? What, what, what did he do? All I know is that he was a great hunter. Okay. Uh, Nathaniel the Neville. Go ahead, Nathaniel. He introduced the worship of mother and child. He did, he did, he did that. Introduced the worship of mother and child. Evelyn? He had relations with the children. Okay, uh, we're not going to say that out loud. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It is true. It is true. Uh, so, the, uh, it's a fact. Nimrod had relations with his mother, and they produced a child called, called who? Who remembers the name of the child? I'll give, you a, I'll give you a hint. Tamus. Tamus. And they worshipped Tamus. In fact, even the Jews worshipped Tamus. In the book of Ezekiel, God's complaint against the Israelites were the fact that they were worshipping Tamus. So read about this guy, Tamus. Uh, and tradition says, who killed Nimrod? Shem. Shem. Noah's son Shem killed Nimrod. That's what tradition says. Imagine that. Secular history writes about Nimrod being killed by Shem, Noah's son. Amazing. Amazing. So anyways, we'll get back to the lesson, but I want to make sure that 
uh, you understand that number 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. In fact, in Genesis chapter uh, 14, we read about the kings that rebelled against Chedorlaomer, the kings of the valley of Sidim. Genesis 14, 4. Twelve years they served Chedorlaomer, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. The they is the king, kings of the valley of Sidim. The valley of Sidim is a valley where the five cities of God was going to destroy, Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the cities was spared because of who? Who remembers our story? Uh, because of Lot, yes. What was the city, city called? You said, I think. Zo Zoar. So, so this is another, to those who say what will happen, will happen. In our, in our lesson in Genesis, God had purposed in his heart to destroy five cities. But Lot said he wanted to flee to one of the cities, and God spared that one city. God changed his plan because of Lot. Keep that in mind. So number 13 in the Bible is, a, is the number of rebellion. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 13, there was a strife between Abraham and Lot, and they separated because the herdmen of Abraham couldn't get along with the herdmen of Lot. So that's a little bit of uh, biblical numerology for you. Uh, I believe it's a part of Scripture. It's, we shouldn't emphasize it too much, but it's there. Uh, you can't deny it that biblical numerology is in the Scriptures, and God does use it. So in Daniel chapter 7, uh, we're going back to Daniel chapter, the book of Daniel now. In Daniel chapter 7, we read about four beasts coming out of the sea. And we know these are four kingdoms from verse 23. So we know that when Daniel says a beast shall rise up out of the sea, he is not literally saying that out of the sea a beast, an animal, will come out of the waters. What Daniel is saying is through the sea of people, through the sea of humanity, a kingdom will rise up. And how do we know that this is symbolic? Because Daniel tells us that four beasts come up out of the sea. And we know that these four beasts are kingdoms when you study the book of Daniel. I'm going to read you some verses from the book of Daniel. Daniel 7.23 says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the what? The whole earth. So this is going to be a worldwide kingdom. It's going to control the world. And it shall tread it down and break it in pieces. Tread down the earth and break down the earth in pieces. So this fourth kingdom that will arise in the future will control the earth. And how do we know today? How, how do countries, how do nations control other nations? Anybody? Taking them over. What was that? Taking them over. Well, taking them over. But what's one method they use to their advantage? Our country does it a lot. Economics, bingo. What is economics? Through the economy. Like, for example, the United States will first pass sanctions against a country. And say any company that does trade with a particular country can no longer trade in the United States. So they use the economy to control other countries. In verse 17 of Daniel chapter 7, we read this. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. So... In Daniel chapter 7, 23, we are told that the four beasts are four kingdoms. I want you to follow the, the logic here. In verse 23, we are told that the four beasts are four kingdoms. And in verse 17, we are told that these beasts are what? Kings. Kings. So can you see how the word beast can be used to describe both a kingdom and a king? It's usually one and the same. Like, uh, for example, we'll see the king of Persia is a beast. And the kingdom of Persia is a beast. So the king of Persia rules over the kingdom of Persia. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Daniel says these kings arise out of the earth. And it's, I want it to be clear that a beast can be both a king and a kingdom at the same time. And so when the Bible says beast, it could be talking about a king and a kingdom at the same time. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So it's important that we have this in our mind as we study the first beast of Revelation chapter 13. We are told that this beast which rises up out of the sea has seven heads and ten horns. This first beast of Revelation chapter 13 is the same as the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. And how do we know that? How do we know that the beast of Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 is the same as the beast of Daniel chapter 7, 
verse 23. Well, for one, they both have ten horns. And they both are present when the Lord returns. Daniel chapter 7, verse 21, we read, And I beheld the same horn which made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time that came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So this horn, this fourth kingdom, this fourth beast makes war with the saints. And he's warring against the saints until when? Until the Lord comes back. Until the Lord comes back. Okay, keep that timeline in your mind. This kingdom, this beast, this king, fights against the saints of God until he comes back. And we know that he comes back when? During the second, say again? During the seventh trumpet. Okay, at the end of the seventh trumpet, but second, we call it the second coming of Christ. It was not meant to be a trick question, but it comes back the second coming of Christ. So this beast will be around when Christ comes back. In the Dino chapter 7, we are given four beasts. We are told a lion with eagle's wings. And we know this beast is the Babylonian Empire. A second beast we are given in Daniel chapter 7 is the Medo-Persian Empire, which is represented by a bear raised up on one side. That's because the Persia was the stronger of the two empires. The third beast, Daniel tells us, is a leopard with four heads. And we know this leopard represents the Greek Empire and its subsequent division. Because we know that after Alexander the Great died, his empire was split into how many empires? Four. Into four empires. And the last beast, the fourth beast, Daniel tells us, is a dreadful beast with iron teeth. So now, Daniel is given a prophetic vision by God. And Daniel sees the Babylonian Empire. Daniel sees the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel sees the Greek Empire. And then God takes it from the Greek Empire all the way down to the end. And he sees the dreadful beast that will be the last kingdom until Christ comes back and takes all the kingdoms. See how God sometimes jumps thousands of years. If you study the Christ as a prophesy, prophecy in the book of, uh, I believe, Malachi that talks about when Christ will be born in Bethlehem or Micah. And then in the same verse, when you study the same verse, God jumps 2,000 years. Talks about the birth of Christ and talks about the second coming of Christ in the same year, in the same verse. God does that a lot of times in the Old Testament. And here in Daniel, no difference. Likewise, God takes him to the third empire, which is Greece. Then he takes him all the way to the future. And he shows him the last dreadful empire with iron teeth. And by the way, what does iron represent in Daniel's prophetic visions? It represents Rome. You can study Daniel chapter 2. Now, we know what these kingdoms represent because we are told what they are in Daniel chapter 2. Remember the image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Who remembers that? Uh, of the great tree? Uh, the, so, the image. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar oh, saw in his dream a great image. The golden head, the golden silver, head. of brass, and then iron mixed silver with clay. That's right. Iron legs and then iron mixed with clay. And Daniel says that all the things that you saw represent kingdoms that will come. And Daniel said to Nebuchadnezzar, Thou art this head of gold. He represented the Babylonian, Babylonian Empire. Look at Lesson 15 in our Revelation study, and we, we spent some time on that. Now, some say that the lion represents Great Britain. Others, the bear, Russia, and the leopard, the United States. I don't see that, because none of these nations have ever occupied or ruled Israel. Remember, if all the history that God gives us in the Old Testament, all the kingdoms that God talks about, He does so because they have something to do with Israel. They are related somehow to Israel. The center of biblical prophecy is Israel. It's not the United States. It's not Great Britain. It's not Russia. Some people will try to find these countries in, in the Bible, but you're not going to find them. You may make the case for Great Britain because they defeated the Ottoman Turks in World War I who were occupying Palestine, but in my opinion, it's a weak case. So, this fourth beast is the last of eight world empires. Again, I'm just giving you some, some information in advance to 
get the wheels turning. We're going to look at these empires, uh, these eight world empires in a subsequent lesson. And this fourth beast undergoes a transformation during the tribulation to become the eighth and last world empire. Because during the tribulation, the Bible tells us that the one of the horns will subdue three horns. Okay, and there are eight empires. We're going to look at that later. Why eight? Because from the birth of the nation of Israel, eight empires will have ruled over them. Again, we will look at these empires in a later lesson. So, this beast in verse 1 is the Antichrist who is ruling over a composite kingdom. Ten crowns. He's ruling over this kingdom. He is the horn, the little horn that Daniel talks about that will rule these kingdoms. Again, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. So, I'm just giving you some introductory material now. Get the wheels turning, and we're going to spend a whole lesson on that because we, we will not be able to cover all this in one lesson. So let's go back to verse 3 of Revelation chapter 13. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So we are told in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 that this beast has how many heads? Seven heads, and we are told that one of the heads are wounded. One of the heads of this beast, that is one of its rulers, receives a wound. We believe this to be an assassination attempt on the Antichrist. How do we get that? From the book of Zechariah. We'll get to that in a little, we'll get to that in a little bit. But I believe when the Antichrist goes to the temple and proclaims that he is God, that some zealous Jew or Jews or group of Jews will attempt to kill him. And that was what happened with Christ. Remember? What was the accusation brought up against them, against the Jewish leaders? Blasphemy. Blasphemy, right? What was the blasphemy? He claimed to himself. Be the Son of God. God. That's right. He claimed to be the Son of God, making himself equal with, with God. Remember, in the Jewish mindset, a man and his son were treated as one. So when Christ says he was the Son of God, they believed him to be God, that he claimed to be God, and Jews called that blasphemy. And Zechariah, and, then, and I believe likewise will happen with the Antichrist, when he proclaims himself to be God. And how do we know he's going to do that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that when he goes into the temple, he will proclaim that he is God. In Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, the Bible says, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth a flock. The sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye his arm shall be cleaned right up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So I take this to be that when this Antichrist proclaims that he is God, that someone will try to stab him. Because it says the, short, the sword shall be upon his arm. So he's going to get cut, and he's going to die from this wound, the Bible says. And then he will recover miraculously out of his wound that he will receive. And when he recovers of this wound, his fame and his influence increase, and we are told all the world wonder after the beast. Do you have a question? Yeah. Is, does this happen before or after the two witnesses are raised from the dead? I believe it happens before. Okay. Because the two witnesses get killed and get raptured before the tribulation ends. The question was, does this happen before or after the witnesses are killed? And I believe it happens before. Okay. Because, the, because the moment the Antichrist dies and is resurrected and he's energized by the devil the bible says he's got 42 months left okay so because he has 42 months left we know that the two witnesses are killed before the tribulation ends because they're killed what what marks the their death something ends at their death the second seal no, no. Trumpet. second woe yeah remember the death of the two witnesses marks the second woe. And the Bible tells us there is one more woe after that. Mm -hmm. And we know that the third woe, the tribulation ends. So this means that the witnesses will die before the end of the tribulation. And because their ministry lasts 42 months, that means their ministry begins before the midpoint of the tribulation. Okay. Okay, so I believe before the Antichrist proclaims that he is God, that the world will have a chance to hear the truth. But unfortunately... They will not believe. And the recovery from this wound that he will receive is mentioned twice 
in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, and Revelation chapter 13, verse 14. And in connection to the world's worship and devotion to the beast, once he is raised from the dead. Imagine this, the world sees this guy get assassinated, probably on live TV. And he dies, and he comes back from the dead. They'll be shocked. They'll be in awe that this guy came back to life. Look at verse 4 now, Revelation chapter 13, verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. You see that in verse 5? Power was given to him to continue forty two months. From where? From the time that he was energized by the devil, from the time that he rose from this, he was healed from this mortal wound. The Bible tells us when that happens, he's got another 42 months left. And verse 6 of Revelation chapter 13. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all, see that, over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So the Antichrist, this beast, will have authority over all the nations of the earth. I've got a couple of questions over here. Uh, Justin, you have a question? So basically this Antichrist guy, he dies in between, he dies right in the middle of the tribulation. About in the middle of the tribulation he dies and he comes back to life. And I believe he dies when he proclaims that he is God. Again, that's what I, I believe that's, because something is going to have to give a reason to those who will try and assassinate him. Nathaniel, you had a question. So does that mean that the two witnesses start their ministry at the very beginning of the tribulation? No, sometime before the middle. I don't know how far from the beginning, but... Because you said that they have ended their ministry before the Antichrist is killed. No. no. Before the end of the tribulation. Before the end of the tribulation. The ministry yeah, the ends. question was, have the witnesses already died when the... Uh, when he comes to power. That's the question. Yeah. The question was, when do the witnesses die? Before the Antichrist comes to um, is raised, raised from the dead. Yeah. is raised from the dead, or after? Right. That was the question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you said before. I said after. When does their ministry start? Their ministry starts before the Antichrist is assassinated. Okay. So the beast rises from the dead, and the Bible tells us he has been given forty-two months, or three and a half years. And this was done by the permission of God. This takes us up all the way to the end of the tribulation. We mentioned that. And then the Antichrist is finally destroyed by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. And I believe this wicked being revealed happens, occurs at the middle of the tribulation period. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Any questions so far before yeah. we go on? Well, how would you factor in the fact that he has three and a half years uh, with the fact that the tribulation is going to be shortened? Is, is that time also going to be shortened, or would that mean that he would have been assassinated a little bit earlier than the three and a half I years? I believe he is, he's given 42 months, but then God decides to cut it off short. Cut it off short. Okay, that makes sense. And that's, that's the only way you can explain it, because the Bible says that those days shall be shortened. But we don't know by how much. Okay. And that's the... That gives you the uh, the uncertainty as to the timing of the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. We know it's going to be at the end of the tribulation. But two months before the end, a week before the end, several weeks, we don't know. But we know it's going to be before because God says specifically that those days shall be shortened. Mm -hmm. So we take it at face value and we take that to mean that he's going to cut it short. Because the Antichrist will try to make war against the uh, the Jews for 42 months. Now, another interpretation could be that uh, those seven years, the, the treaty that the Antichrist signs could be seven years of 365 days. But God uses seven, year, seven prophetic years, which is 360 days. So if you do the math, you're looking at 45 days, 360 to 365, that's five days times seven years, that's what, 35 days? Yeah, 35 days. So there's a 35 day uncertainty there. Because okay. we know the Antichrist is not going to sign the treaty for seven prophetic years. At least I, at least I think that. Okay. Any 
make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. So the worship of the dragon and the beast, is that going to be similar to like the father and son, do you think? We're going to get that. Oh. We're going to get that. And you're right. You're on the right track. <laughs> you're on the right track. But notice in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, what the world will do after the Antichrist comes back to life. They worship the dragon. And who is the dragon? Satan. Satan. So they will know that the Antichrist will come back to life with the power of the dragon, with the power of the devil. It is a startling phenomenon today that in our country, Satan worship is on the increase. And it's becoming more and more popular every year. But today, it's only a tiny fraction of Americans, sadly to say, that worship the devil. But in the tribulation, it's going to be mainstream Satan worship. The IRS officially recognized the Satanic Temple as a church. They gave them a 501c3. So they are officially a church in the United States. Now there's a, a prevailing thought among elites, and I'm not, it's more than a thought, I believe, that they, that they are actually Luciferians. Who's, who's heard of this term? A lot of people on top are Luciferians. A Luciferian or a Luciferianism is the belief that reveres Lucifer, not as a devil, but as the liberator, a guardian, or a, guide, a, a, a guiding spirit. And he is even considered to be the true God, as opposed to Jehovah, the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. In fact, in, uh, in the Masonic Order and the Freemasons, at the highest levels, they worship Lucifer as the true God. I'm going to... I'm going to throw something out there. If anyone's listening, you may find this a little offensive. Try and find the word Lucifer in any modern English version. Okay. So I'm going to see on that. Why do you think they removed that word from the Bible? The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So the devil has deceived men today, having them think that he is the true God, that it was because of him that we have knowledge, that we know knowledge. And what was the lie that he gave to Eve? Eat of the fruit and you will be a God. You will know the difference between good and evil. The same thing happens today. He's deceived mankind, saying that if you follow me, you will know more things, you will be enlightened, your eyes will be opened. So, uh, remember when we studied the three phases of the Antichrist rule? Does anybody remember the study that we did a while back ago? Do you have a question? I do. Okay, before we get into that, I'll, I'll answer your question. Go ahead. Do you think that they will understand when they're worshipping the, the dragon? Do you think that they'll understand the fact that they're worshipping Satan? Or will that just be part of the whole delusion? That'll be part of the whole delusion. So the they're honestly going to think that it's God raised from the dead. Yeah, the, the, the answer was, when they're going to be worshipping the devil, do they, will they know who they're worshipping? Well, they will, I think they will be deceived into thinking that Lucifer, Satan, the dragon, is, that real, is the God that we need to worship. Whereas Jesus Christ brought us bondage, giving us rules, tying us down, not letting us do what we want to do. I believe they will be deceived, even today. I mean, we know, prophetically speaking, what the dragon is. But will they understand that? I don't think they will understand that he is the devil, but they will be deceived. Hmm. Remember, what's one of the greatest lies that the devil has foisted upon mankind is that he does not exist. Right. And the second lie is that he's harmless. Mm -hmm. That's the second lie, that the devil is harmless. Now, don't worry about it, you know... Uh, I'm going to say this, but it may not sit well with some of you. For example, Halloween. They've taken a pagan holiday, which is strictly pagan, mm -hmm. and they've made it into a light thing. Oh, it's just for ki candies. and uh, I'm all for giving candies to kids, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But they've made light of this holiday. Mm -hmm. 
You know what I'm saying? So, like, look at the modern TV shows today. All the goblins and ghouls and ghosts, and vampires and zombies and all this. They make it like into a light thing. The yeah, devil, that's, that's another lie of the devil. He's harmless. It, it's okay. The devil is not going to do anything to you. That couldn't be further from the truth. And we studied the three phases of the Antichrist rule. Remember the first one? He is revealed. I believe he, would, he will be revealed uh, before the tribulation begins. We don't know how. We don't know if we're going to recognize I believe the true Christians are going to recognize him. Then we said that he appears as the son of perdition when he signs a peace treaty. And then when he rises from the dead, he will be considered as that wicked one. And then when he comes back from life, he will be energized by Satan. The Bible even tells us that the people will acknowledge the dragon who gave power to the beast. The Bible tells us that when he comes back to life, they will know that it was a dragon who gave power unto the beast. And the Bible says... When he comes back to life, when, he's rise, when he rises from the dead, again, we're reading between the lines. The Bible doesn't explicitly say that he rises from the dead. All he tells us is that he was healed from a mortal wound. That's what the Bible says. He was healed from a mortal wound. And what's a mortal wound? Everything. That's right. It's a wound that makes you dead. And then when he comes back, he persecutes the saints of God. But he not only persecutes them, now he engages... In military conflict, I believe there will be civil wars all across the earth. People fighting for the freedoms like never before. And we're also told that this beast will blaspheme God. Now blasphemy is the act of insulting or showing contempt or a lack of reverence for God, often laced with profanity. And in Daniel chapter 7, 25, we are told the same thing. And he shall speak great words against the Most High. This this phrase, great words, does not necessarily uh, mean flattering words or good words. It means great words, words that will insult God. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into His hand until a time and times and a dividing of time. So after He comes back from this mortal wound, He will be given a power to rule over the kingdoms of the earth for 42 months. And Daniel 7.25 agrees with Revelation chapter 13, verse 7. So this beast rules over every tribe, kindred, language, and nation. So this is more than an individual country. Furthermore, this beast, which is a king in the kingdom, is also a man. And the Bible says he has a number. We'll get to that in a little bit. The Bible tells us that his number is 666. This is the Antichrist. This is the number of the Antichrist. So now... Let's go back to our text, Revelation chapter 13. Read a few more verses. Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. And if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience of the saints, patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast, coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. We are now introduced to the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. The first beast was the Antichrist, who is a king, and who is also, the, this beast represented not only the Antichrist, but he also represents the last kingdom that will be on the earth. Verse 12, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So you see what the second beast does? He pushes people to worship the first beast. Verse 13, And this second beast, who doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had a, the wound by a sword and did live. You see that in verse 14? We are told that this wound that he received was received by a what? Sword. Sword. What does that remind you of? We just read in Zechariah that this man received a wound. The idle shepherd received a wound by a sword. Verse 15. 
And he had power to give life. This is the second beast. Had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So after the Antichrist is revived from his mortal wound, the earth will worship him, and they will also make an image of him. A statue, an idol. Yes, you have a question? Um, yes. Will God give the will God give this person the ability to do these miracles? The devil has powers to do miracles. He's an angel. He does have some power, right? And maybe this sword is actually a knife. Sword or a dagger or a short knife, but it's it's a bladed instrument. Yes, in fact. The beginning to sound a lot like the Trinity. Yes, mm -hmm. we'll get to that in a little bit. We're almost What's there. That? Hang on, we're almost there. So, and when they make the image of the beast, the Bible says they will worship the image. And this is idolatry. But there's another character here that we are introduced to who pushes for the worship of the beast. And he also is called the beast. But he's described as a two-horned, lamb-like beast which speaks as a dragon. And he is able to sway men and to convince them that they worship, that they ought to worship the beast. And the way he convinces them is by performing miracles. And it is this second beast that prompts the fabrication or the manufacture of this image. And we know from studying other passages and verses in the Bible that this image of the Antichrist is called the abomination of desolation. So the second beast has the same authority as the first beast though his authority is delegated by the first beast. So, the second beast, when he comes, has been given authority by the first beast. You guys follow what's, mm -hmm. what's going on here? So the first beast we know is the Antichrist. And who is the second beast? We'll find out. He is the false prophet. That's exactly right. So this beast performs miracle, and he erects an image in the honor of the first beast. Remember Nebuchadnezzar? He was a type of the Antichrist because he set up an image and he caused all in his kingdom to worship the image. And if he did not worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, you would be killed. See how history repeats itself? So this beast, the second beast, his role is to cause the world to follow and to worship the Antichrist. And the Bible tells us that the image comes to life. And he could speak. And then the second beast says to the world, if you do not worship the image, you will die. Now we could say that this second beast is the anti-spirit in what we will soon make a connection here into the satanic trinity. This false prophet, this beast is given the name, the false prophet in Revelation chapter 16 verse 13. And he is also mentioned twice in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The second beast, elsewhere in the book of Revelation, is called the false prophet. And this false prophet says, if you do not worship the image, and if you do not take the mark of the beast, you will be killed to death. And what does the Bible tell us about this? If anybody worships the image and takes the mark, Yes. Is it put to death or killed? Killed. Put to death. Killed. Same thing. You say killed to death. Killed to death. Put to death. <laughs> Brain cells don't always work 100%. So I want to quote what uh, Larkin in his commentary on the book of Revelation says that neatly summarizes the satanic trinity that we alluded to. So we have... The first beast of verse 1, which we know as the Antichrist. We have the second beast later on in, in Revelation chapter 13. And then we have the image that is created. And this image comes to life. This is what Larkin says. And I'm, I'm reading what he says because he neatly summarizes this so-called satanic trinity. He says, in the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet... We have the satanic trinity, Satan's imitation of the divine trinity, and the unseen, the invisible dragon, we have the father, the anti-god, 
In the beast, which is the Antichrist, we have the son of perdition, begotten of the dragon, who appears on earth, dies, and is resurrected, and to whom it is given a throne by his father, the dragon. In a false prophet, we have the anti-spirit, who proceeds from the dragon. And the dragon, so Larkin says we have the dragon father, which is the devil. We have the dragon son, which is the antichrist. And we have the dragon spirit, which is the false prophet. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Again, the antichrist is to be a king and rule over a kingdom. Again, I'm continuing uh, a quote from Larkin. He will accept the kingdom of this world that Satan offered Christ and that Christ refused in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 through 10. He will also exalt himself and claim to be God. This is clearly found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. But the false prophet is not a king. He does not exalt himself, but he exalts the first beast, the Antichrist. His relation to the first beast is the same as the Holy Spirit's relation to Christ. Do you see how the devil has tried to imitate the Trinity? See that? You've got the dragon, which is the devil. You've got the Antichrist, who is energized by the devil. And he's called the son of perdition. And then you have the false prophet, which represents, in a way, the Holy Spirit. It doesn't represent the Holy Spirit, but imitates the Holy Spirit during tribulation. So the general belief, and I agree, is that this false prophet will be a future pope that will form an alliance with the Antichrist, enabling him to access the resources and influence of the Roman Catholic Church. And this interpretation is backed up by John's description of the woman who rides the beast in Revelation chapter 17. And more on this when we get to chapter 17. Now I'm told that we're, we're out of time, so let's stop here to make sure we answer any questions before we go on. I was going to start off the Mark of the Beast, uh, but we'll continue that next week. There's a lot of information in Revelation chapter 13. So we're going to spend a few lessons on this chapter. Just like we spend a lot of lessons on the rapture, trying to make it clear to show you that the rapture of the church will happen before the tribulation. We want to make, make it clear. We wanted, it, we wanted to make it clear. Likewise, we're going to spend some time on this chapter. So all the things that we talk about will be will actually be clear in your mind. Any quick questions or comments before we sign off? Dan, you had a question. Quick question. So regarding the image uh, that's set up inside the temple, um, is it the view that it's just a demonic image or statue that is given this ability to move and talk? Or because I know a lot of people have this view that. John saw some kind of robot or TV screen or something to that nature. Well, the question was, what, what will the image that the Antichrist will be when, when he sets it up in the temple? What form will it take? I believe it will be a physical form. Because the Bible says it's an abomination of desolation. He calls it an image. And we know from scriptures that the image is a statue, an idol, that people bow down and worship in the Old Testament. Now... We are also told that this image will come to life. It will be alive. And that's what's going to be, that's, that's what will cement the delusion to mankind, having this object come to life. Mm. Now, the, the speculation is, will it be artificial intelligence? Will it be a robot? We can think of all things based on the technology that we have right now, all you got to do is look at the robotics technology that has been developed now. How far we are in, in advance. And we, we have no idea what else the military is working on, how, how far advanced these robots are. What will it be exactly? I can't say emphatically, but I could say it will be a physical image that will be given life to the point that it will amaze the people of the earth. And the Bible says that this image, when it comes to life, will be able to speak, and he will command pe that people be killed if they don't worship. Now, how will this image be energized? Could it be through demons, through Satan? Possibly. Could it be some advanced, you know, uh, robot that we're not aware of? Possibly. So, I, I, again, I'm trying, not trying to be elusive here, 
But the only way you can see emphatically, it'll be a physical object, a physical statue, a physical idol. Of what form? We cannot say. It'll be like the beast. It'll be like what? The beast. The beast, yes. It, it will be in the form of the beast. Yes, sir. Um, I've been tossed about uh, many times when I read about, uh, uh, when I went through Re Revelation before, um, about the beast coming out of the sea and the description of the beast. This description is not seen by many uh, in that way. It represents, we'll get into that, it represents countries, it, re it represents kings. Okay. But how, how is it seen? talking about this beast being the Antichrist. Yes. Okay, so you're not talking about countries or, or kings. Both. Both, because the Bible uses the beast to represent like, for example, when, you, when we study, and I think we're going to spend a little bit more time on this, when you go into the book of Daniel and you study the beasts, for example, the goat. There's a goat that comes out of the west that ru runs into a ram with two horns. And Daniel sees, basically, he sees a goat and a ram butting heads. He sees these two animals. And then he tells him that the goat is the king of Greece. And the ram is the king of Persia. And the goat represents the Greek Empire. And the ram represents the Persian Empire. So you see the goat representing both Alexander the Great and his empire as a beast. And the ram representing the king of Persia and the empire of the Persians. And these two animals are fighting. But we know in this case it's symbolic because we are told that the he-goat represents the king of Greece. And once we get into a little bit more study, you'll see that this beast that comes out of the sea, the ten horns, these horns and these, uh, these uh, heads represent something. Because we are told in subsequent chapters in the book of Revelation that, that the heads, some of the heads represent mountains. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So, so the second beast will have, will be able to... Uh, control many yes mm -hmm. because uh, basically because of ignorance of the truth unfortunately yes let's see what shocks me is when i study the book the revelation chapter 13 it clearly tells us that the people of the earth will worship the dragon and we know from the book of revelation that the dragon is yeah. the no. devil and they will willingly worship the devil truth. Exactly. And I believe that's where the delusion comes in. That's where the deception is. Mm -hmm. He's the angel of light. He's the angel of light. He's the angel of light. Yeah. yeah. So we're still... Okay, so next week we'll continue on Revelation chapter 13. On the... We'll spend some more time on the beast and the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. Goodbye. Till next week. <laughs>